Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Who's had a good day? <laughs> nice. Yeah, so good. Some people have had a good day. I'm not quite so convinced. Anyone else had a good day? Yeah. Okay, nice. That, that'll do me. I'm Mark, for those of you who don't know me. And I'm Imogen, and we are hosting today's International Cafe Session, um, which is actually not only taking place in the Wonder Tent, we are also live streaming to the Piazza, which is so, Ooh. so cool. So Piazza, if you're wondering where we are, um, we are just behind the Zeman, next to the Degree Apprenticeship Building, um, kind of on a gravelly bit in a big white tent. It's lovely and warm in here. We've got some great cakes. Um, so do come along. We've got some hot drinks. But most importantly, we are having a talk on who is Jesus Christ and why is he so wonderful. So please do come along and hear what that's all about. And it'll be followed by a short Q&A. Exactly. Um, and one other thing to mention is that during this talk, um, there should be a QR code that comes up now. I'm going to get out of the way. Hang on. Um, if you want to follow along with the talk, um, then there you can get the talk notes. Um, so feel free to get your phones out now and scan the QR code if you want to know what's going on. Yeah, cool. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, but please do um, ask some questions in the Q&A that we have got following this, it's going to be a short Q&A time. So during the talk, just think about what you might want to ask in, um, and hopefully your question will be answered. Um, so I'm going to invite Kin up right now, um, and he's going to share a bit about um, his testimony as well, which is really exciting. So yeah. It's facial recognition, but you can't recognize my face in this <laughs> dim lighting at the moment. I've got to put in my PIN number now, excuse me. <laughs> ah, right, okay, I can see it. Yeah, I couldn't do it last night. Well, good evening, or good afternoon, or good late afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to joining this tent and also at the Piazza, welcome to all of you too. Okay, my name is uh, Kin Fan Lao. As I said yesterday, people call me Kin normally, but my middle name is, uh, Fan is my middle name. That's how I would, uh, you know, break the ice normally. Okay. Right, last, yesterday I talked about the, um, the subject of uh, uh, whether Christianity has, uh, is compatible with science. Now today, we come to the most important message, which is, who is Jesus Christ, and why is he so wonderful? Okay? Now, before I start, I'll just share a little bit of my earlier life, my testimony. But I would begin by saying that our lives are the direct result of our decision-making, all the decisions that you make in your life. Okay? directly affect your, your lives. You see, in my life, I made two very important decisions, okay? The second one, the second most important one is to marry not just any, any girl, but my wife, Louisa. Her name is Kwai Fan Louisa Lau. Now, we've been married for 36 years now, and, you know, hand on my heart, okay? She's the best wife I could ever wish for. Now, we were in love when we married, and even more now, after 36 years, and the flames of marriage just get hotter and hotter for us. Now, my wife is not only my uh, soulmate, my lover, my helper, uh, and if perfection is ever anywhere near attainable in this lifetime, I would say that my wife is possibly the most perfect person I've ever met in my life. So when I decided to marry her and she decided likewise, we were a happy couple, okay? Now there is a saying, maybe it's a bit too, too advanced for you guys yet. Happy wife, happy life is absolutely true, 
All right, just take that from me, okay? Now, but marrying my wife, Louisa, wasn't the greatest decision I've ever made. No, no, by no means, no. The greatest decision I ever made in my life was my decision to believe in Jesus Christ as God's only son and as my Lord and Savior. Because if it weren't for him, I would probably never ever have met my wife. But then there are many other reasons why Jesus Christ is so wonderful. Okay? Now, I wasn't religious at all um, uh, uh, during my teenage years. Um, all I wanted was to be a scientist. Um, and, um, and when I was an undergraduate in my first year at Durham, a long, long time ago, I made quite a few good friends. And some of them were Christians. And they were also very friendly. And they were so warm. And they invited me to talks during a, a mission weekend. Okay. Sounds familiar? So I was being dragged along, okay, not a tent, but a town hall to listen to talks. But then that started my faith journey because a few months afterwards, I came to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. All right? So coming back here to Warwick is my second in a mission week, okay? It's like me paying a debt of gratitude, okay? Coming back to a mission at a university campus. Uh, to be able to share my life with you, it, it is my privilege and my honor. Okay, so in my first year, I, I was being invited to Bible studies afterwards, and uh, I was going to church. Now, not because I wanted to, but because one of my female colleagues, she's very pretty, or she was anyway, you know, I felt that I should go along as well. So my, my motive was all noble, really. It, it wasn't noble at all, looking back. Yeah, but that journey started, and I came to faith uh, in April the next year, still in my first year. However, when I went home after my first term at Christmas, I remember watching a television program. You ever heard of television? Do you guys watch television? Yeah, you see, in my days, there was no internet. Uh, there was no Netflix. All we had was like, you know, some, some like black and white television and a color te television. And I remember watching a program, okay, that caught my attention because it was a very famous actor called Lawrence Olivier. He was reciting a passage of the Bible and he was reading the Gospel of John, verse one, uh, chapter one, verse 14, which says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us full of grace and truth. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Now, for reasons that I cannot explain, I was so gripped by that one verse. And I can still remember that I was thinking, if this is true, that the Son of God became man and lived amongst us, then this surely must be the most wonderful thing that's ever happened in the world. And that's stuck in my mind. Now, 45 years later, I see those four words, the word became flesh, as the most profound four words in the entire Bible. The word who was in the beginning with God the word that through whom the universe was created and for him it was created became flesh like you and me. Let me show you how, how incredible this is by leading you on a journey, okay? I'm gonna lead you uh, 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 on a journey into space, okay? Now, look, I don't have a rocket, all right? But I've got pictures of uh, astrophotography. I've caught pictures of like planets and stars. I will use those pictures to lead you on, on a journey through space. Would you like that? All right, okay, let's, let's give it a try, yeah? Do I point there? Oh, I'm going back, sorry. Right, so. 
let's start from here, okay? Uh, moonlit evenings, and then we'll take a ride on a rocket. So we go to the moon first, our nearest celestial body. Now these are all my photographs. They weren't downloaded from Google. Getting a bit closer. We're going to fly by the moon. Okay, there's a crater Plato there right at the bottom. Actually, the image is actually inverted. So north is down, south is up. Right, we're going to fly by the moon. Oh, what's that? What is that? It's the planet Mars. Okay, that is the best picture I've ever taken of Mars from my back garden. All right? Okay, we can fly by Mars now. Let's get to the next planet, the giant planet Jupiter. Okay, you see three of the moons there. I showed it last night. Uh, you see the great red spot. It's so big that the Earth can be contained in it. Now, this one is interesting. Watch the dark spot on the atmosphere of Jupiter. What could possibly be causing the shadow on the planet? Ah, you see? There, that moon appears there, but it's very faint. You can't see from the back. That's why you see at the front. That is probably the moon Io, yeah? Totally volcanic. The closest moon to Jupiter. Let's let's carry on flying, shall we? Okay, say goodbye to Jupiter. To Saturn. And now we go into interstellar space. Now we're at 444 light years away. We see the uh, the star cluster Pleiades, nicknamed the Seven Sisters, because there are seven bright stars there. We're watching it as if. As, as it was 444 years ago, because light takes 440 years to get here, in, into my camera lens. And we're watching at 1,400 light years away, the Dumbbell Nebula, and the famous Orion Nebula. If you look at the night sky now at 8 o'clock towards the, towards the south, you can see the constellation Orion very clearly, and that is just at down the belt of the Orion of the Orion constellation. Right, this is the NG3, NGC six nine six zero, which is a, uh, a cloud of uh, highly ionized gases and dust in the constellation of uh, Cygnus. Right, we see here a the M three a globular star cluster at about 30,000 light years away, above the plane of our galaxy. Let's go further. Now, this is the famous Andromeda galaxy at two and a half million light years away. Further still, we see a couple of galaxies, the M81, the 82, they're at 12 million light years away. Let's keep going. Oh, this is the, uh, the, the pinwheel galaxy at 20 million light years away. Let's keep going. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy and 23 million light years away. And here we see a triplet of galaxies in the constellation Leo, okay, at about 35 million light years away. So we, we, we're seeing them as they were 35 million years ago. It took like that long to get into my camera lens. Now, my telescope has so far seen this as the most remote at 85 million light years away. Remember, I'm watching this from my back garden in London, not from the, uh, you know, um, you know Ho Hubble Space Telescope, okay? Now, why am I doing this? Now, the diameter of the universe is estimated to be about 92 billion light years away according to, you know, current uh, cosmology. And this is amazing because from the Bible it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through, all, through him all things were made. And without him nothing was made that has ever that has been made. 
And then verse 14 says, the word became flesh. The word who was in the beginning with God and who was God, and through the word all things were made, that word became flesh. That word became someone like me, you and me. Okay? And there's a, an amazing uh, truth and fact. So let's see how it's done. Yeah? So I'm going to uh, you know, you know, um, simulate God coming into our world okay? through coming back to the slides. The moon now, the earth, I didn't take this, that's download from Google. And all the way to Bethlehem in Palestine. Now, that is absolutely amazing. God sent his son Jesus into the world, into Palestine, and he was born in Bethlehem. Okay? So, why is Jesus so wonderful? Now, Jesus Christ is, is not a, a myth or a um, fictional character in a, in, in a book like uh, Harry Potter. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And the Gospel of Matthew and Luke um, testify to where he was born. Now, So Matthew and Luke are the internal evidence in the Bible that points to the fact that Jesus is a historical character, not a myth, not a fictional character, but a historical character. Now, outside the Bible, there are several references to Jesus Christ as the historical person. Okay? One of the most famous is the, uh, is, um, the Roman governor of uh, Bithynia, Pliny the Younger, because he wrote to the then Emperor Trajan, asking for advice to deal with the Christians. You have got uh, a Jewish historian, Josephus, okay, who wrote in his works, The Antiquities of the Jews, he mentioned Jesus in there, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And the Roman historian, Tacitus, he wrote in his major works covering a period of, um, from the year AD 14 to, six, to 96, he wrote about suspicion that Emperor Nero probably was responsible for burning down the city of Rome and laying the blame onto the Christians. So these are just three examples, external examples outside the Bible that mention Jesus as a real historical figure. Now, Jesus is so wonderful for many other reasons, okay? Right. I think too many things to do to, to click and turn here. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was a birth of wonder. The Bible tells us that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that is, without a human father, and born of a virgin who had not had sexual intercourse with a man. And Mary was engaged to a man called Joseph, but an angel of the Lord revealed to Joseph that Mary was pregnant with child, and he did not have sexual relationship during her pregnancy of Jesus. Now, as Jesus grew up in the family of a human father, he grew to become fully aware that he is the, the only son of God, the Father, and experienced a kind of unique relationship with God the Father that only the Son of God himself could. He knew he was being sent into the world on a mission. And he began his public ministry by first getting baptized by the, John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And that was to fulfill all righteousness, Jesus said. This means that the righteousness required by the Old Testament law was fulfilled. 
Then a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. From Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. So Jesus' birth was extraordinary. Maybe if, uh, uh, Oliver, you can actually turn the slides for me, because I'm having too many things to, to click at the moment. Okay, so let's stay on this slide. Now, as soon as Jesus was declared by God to be the Son of God, Jesus was being led into the desert to be tempted by the devil. The Gospel according to Matthew in chapter 4 verses 1 to 11 tells us that after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, when physically Jesus was at his weakest and most vulnerable, the devil came to tempt him. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones to become bread. If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil again said, All this I will give you, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, I like the way Jesus answered the third temptation. Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, all of us face temptations in life. Some people categorize that the three areas of greatest temptation are power, money, and sex. Now, so many polit politicians and celebrities that we know fall into such temptations. When Jesus was at his physically weakest and most vulnerable, the devil came to tempt him. And Jesus showed us, he overcame the greatest temptations that humankind would ever face and would never be able to overcome. Jesus overcame. Okay, let's look at the wonderful compassion of Christ Jesus. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, we are told of a story about a leper encountering uh, Jesus. Leprosy is more or less gone from the world now. But in the time of Jesus, leprosy was very well widespread amongst the people of the world. Leprosy is the way a person's body slowly and cruelly. It is a very contagious disease. Um, if somebody stays in like a dungeon for several years in damp condition without sunlight, that person could have leprosy. Now, if somebody became a leper in those days, he or she would become an outcast from his community. Why? because it's very contagious, infectious. You know, nobody would touch a leper. You know why? Because once you touch him, if you are a Jew, okay, you become unclean. And you could potentially be infected by leprosy. So if you are diagnosed with leprosy, you're more or less de you know, destined for leaving your community. Lepers would actually live in caves, okay, in dwellings away from human community. Now, this story tells that when Jesus came down from the mountainside, the large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Nobody would touch a leper. Jesus went to touch a leper and healed him. 
that was amazing. The, com com the compassion he had for the person with the leprosy. Not only did he heal the leper, do you know what he did? He told the, 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 the healed le uh, leper to go to see the priest. Why? Because to get, to get the priest to declare him to be clean again, it's a bit like signing a medical all clear certificate to allow the man to go back and return to his family and his community. So not only did Jesus heal the leper, he restored him back to his community. What wonderful compassion of Jesus Christ. Next. Let's look at the wonderful wisdom of Jesus Christ. Now in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, we are told that um, a, a certain woman was being brought before Jesus. It says, at dawn, he appeared in the temple courts and with, where, where all the people are gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Indeed, it was a trap. It was a, a, a no-win situation. You see, if Jesus said, let her go and saved her, then the religious leaders would say, well, you know, you're not following the law of Moses. They would discredit Jesus by saying in public, why this man doesn't follow the law of Moses in punishing the adulteress. On the other hand, if Jesus agreed with the stoning of the adulteress, the people would say Jesus was as cold-blooded as the Pharisees and without mercy and allowed the adulteress to be stoned to death. What should Jesus do? What would you do in such a moral dilemma? Let's read on. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now in such a moral dilemma, Jesus found a way out. Who is without sin in this life? He turned the table around and the accuser of the adulteress slowly walked away, speechless. Now every time when I read this story, I'm, I'm moved by, by the um, wonderful wisdom and deep compassion that Jesus had in resolving such a moral dilemma. Now this story has crept into our common English usage. Cast the first stone, people say. Yeah? It's an idiom now uh, with its root in this particular passage. Now we say to cast the first stone means to be quick to point the finger and blame and chastise and punish somebody who has done something wrong. Next slide, please. Now, Jesus died by crucifixion on the cross. Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ to die as an innocent man was written in the script when he was born. The word became flesh in John chapter 1, verse 14, was to die innocently for all of humankind. This was the purpose of his coming into the world. 
You see, in Old Testament times, man's sins are dealt with by offering sacrifices of animals that had to die in the place of man. Jesus Christ came to die as an offering, not for his own sins, because he had committed no sin, but for the sins of humankind. Whereas animal sacrifices were offered continually and religiously, the difference with Jesus Christ's death was that it was offered as a sacrifice only once, and once and for all, for the whole of humankind. Now, man sins against God, and only God can forgive sins. And only God can offer himself as sacrifice, and only man can offer himself as sacrifice for his fellow man. So with the word who became flesh, God became man. Jesus Christ as God and man died on the cross for the sins of all humankind once and for all. Jesus Christ paid for the sins of all fellow men and women once and for all. But Jesus did not stay dead because next slide please. Because on the third day after his death he rose again, he resurrected. The Gospels tell us that on the third day after his death on the cross, Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus appeared to his disciples many times over the next 40 days. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his disciples before he was taken into heaven, but you will receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Next slide. This is one of my favorite paintings hung in the National Gallery. I mentioned yesterday that uh, going to art gallery is one of my hobbies. Okay. Now, this particular painting was painted by the famous Italian Baroque painter, Caravaggio. He painted a moment, that moment, when on the road of Emmaus, when the two disciples suddenly realized the guy they were having supper with was Jesus, who had died only, you know, three days before. He painted their shock and in such drama, okay? that they suddenly saw this guy they were having supper with is actually Christ risen. And I love going to, to look at this picture. I normally spend about 20 to 30 minutes sitting there contemplating about that moment, how it would have been when the two disciples recognized Jesus. Next slide. Now, Jesus Christ's resurrection impacted the lives of his t the disciples inside out. About 10 days later, when the disciples obeyed Jesus and gathered together in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit of God came like wind and fire and descended onto his disciples. The power of the Holy Spirit of God was manifested and his disciples all speaking in different tongues, different, of different languages, languages that people from all over the Mediterranean spoke and could understand. That day, which was the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people believed in the name of Jesus Christ. The church, the Christian church, was born on that day. Now these disciples who were once fishermen and tax collector and religious extremists were so impacted by the resurrection of Jesus that from then on, these disciples risked their lives in all sorts of ways to preach the good news of Christ as instructed by him. Now we, you can read about the changed lives in the book of, uh, of, of the Acts of the Apostles and the rest of the New Testament. About the New Testament and the Bible, I will talk more about it tomorrow. Jesus Christ's impact on my life is also total. I already told you that if, if it weren't for Jesus, I would not have gone to church. I wouldn't have met my darling wife. I already did, uh, you, uh, originally learned about Jesus through the Bible, 
from the Gospels. But then his deep compassion for his fellow man, his out-of-the-world wisdom, his amazing teachings about the kingdom of God, he struggles with the prospect of going to be crucified on the cross affected me to the core of my being. I used to be, when, when I was a lot younger, I used to be quite arrogant, quite self-centered, and a bit detached from everyone because I didn't want to be hurt by anyone else. I didn't want to have close relationship with people. It was my way of to protect myself. But the Holy Spirit slowly changed me from the inside out. He fills me with a deep sense of worshipful reverence for God, a deep love for God's creation, like the universe, the stars and galaxies. Nature, trees, human cultures, and growing compassion and love for all kinds of people I encounter in my life, including you lot. So, Jesus Christ is wonderful. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? I've got enough evidence in my life to prove to myself that God is real and Jesus Christ is the only Son of God that was sent into the world through space and time to be our saviour. Okay, amen. Is this on? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Kin, for that really powerful message. Um, so we're going to go into a short time discussion now for a few minutes. And do cook up some good questions. I'm sure Kin would love to answer them. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have a Slido thing come up here um, <laughs> at some point. So please do scan that. Um, and the questions uh, will be up on the screen, but you will remain anonymous. So please do ask away. <laughs> 